Up next, we bring you a roundtable discussion of events in the Persian Gulf. The American Muslim Council sponsors this monthly roundtable. The topic on Wednesday night was Muslims and the Gulf Crisis. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Gentlemen, welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is the American Muslim Council Roundtable discussion. Today we will discuss the issue of the crisis, the Gulf crisis, and Muslims and the Gulf crisis. I will introduce brief, briefly my guests. On my right, Dr. Suleiman Yang from Howard University. Then we have Dr. Jim Zogbi from the American Arab American Institute. Dr. Muhammad Safa from Southeastern University, Mr. Muayyad Shah, the editor of the uh, Eastern Times, Professor Jafar Sheikh Idris from the Institute of Islamic and Arabic Studies, and of course my friend Mr. Jawad George from the National Arab American Association. Gentlemen, thank you for coming in our round table. I guess I would start with the question of, I would address this question to Mr. Uh, Dr. Zerbi or um, Mr. Jawad. What will, how will this crisis affect Arab Americans here politically? Jim? Well, I, I think that the reaction is, uh, is quite complex. And the, the complexity of the <coughs> reaction is a function of the complexity of our community on one level. Mm -hmm. We're a community of both recent immigrants and first, second, and third generation people of Arab descent who respond to the crisis as a function of their assimilation level in America and also their recent experiences. Egyptians will respond in a different way maybe than uh, Jordanians or Iraqis or Palestinians or, uh, or Lebanese. And so we have been assessing the various responses and having an internal discussion within the community. What I think has been important at this point to note is that a number of constants hold. One is there's a cross the board um, feeling that what Iraq did was wrong. Um, there is a sense at the same time uh, <clears throat> that we need a family discussion and that we must keep the discussion respectful and tolerant because we've been building this community now for 20 years and don't want to lose what we've already gained. And, and so while we will differ, we have a community in which to differ, whereas 20 years ago, we had the discussion by ourselves in separate homogeneous groups. On the other hand, I think that the crisis has, in a sense, provoked the sense in the community that we have so much to do to make our voice heard in America. It's, it's like a 100 mile an hour bus is coming rushing at us. It's 10 feet away. And some of us don't know whether to say stop or uh, let me explain or wait a minute, you don't understand. And so we realize that we really have a lot to do so that we can make our voice and our positions as varying as they are heard in America. Joanne? Well, um, there are some differences in the community. I think it's important to note the points of consensus that Jim alluded to. Uh, first of all, I think there's virtually a universal condemnation of the invasion itself and a feeling that there should be total and unconditional withdrawal by the Iraqi forces of Kuwait. I think also there's virtual consensus that the legitimate government of Kuwait needs to be restored. I think there's virtual consensus within the community uh, with respect to the keeping of the hostages and the feeling that that action is uh, unwarranted and that the Iraqis should release, release the hostages. There is a point of divergence when it comes to the issue of deployment of U.S. troops, but I think everyone generally agrees that the U.S. troops should be brought back as soon as possible once the issue is resolved. I think that the community has been pointing out essentially a certain hypocrisy in terms of the position of the United States government. The United States action in Kuwait is governed on sound principles of international law. They are the opposition of acquisition of territory by force and self-determination for the people of Kuwait. And those principles have been ratified in the various UN Security Council resolutions. However, if you look to the situation 
uh, governing Palestine, where you have those exact same principles in operation. And you have UN Security Council resolutions calling upon Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories. In that instance, the United States, instead of putting pressure on Israel, in fact give, gives Israel political, economic, and military support. And that basic hypocrisy is something that Arab Americans and Arabs generally view um, in terms of assessing the U.S. real intentions in the region. Uh, Professor Niang, what about the Muslims? Yeah, I think the Muslim reaction is very much similar to the reaction in the, I mean, the Arab community, Arab American community. Uh, of course, the Muslim community is much more diverse because you do have uh, almost a microcosm of the Islamic world in America, uh, various nationalities. Uh, but I think I would uh, agree with both uh, Jim and George here in saying that uh, there is definitely almost unanimous opinion with regard to the illegality of the invasion of Kuwait by, because the very Arab state system and the fundamental principles which are responsible for the founding of the Organization of Islamic Conference uh, negate the invasion of territory by a sister country. So definitely Iraq is wrong. It was dangerous and unwise for President Saddam Hussein to take Kuwaiti territory. This is widely accepted in the Muslim community. I have talked to Muslims from various parts of the Islamic world and there is virtual uh, consensus on this point. The second point of agreement is the manner in which uh, the uh, Iraqis uh, move into the area and thereby uh, violating the rights of the average Kuwaiti. Because there are certain things that are being rumored and reported in the media which are definitely on Islamic. And it should be condemned by all Muslims wherever they come from. And I'm sure the sentiment is similarly expressed in the Arab American community. Now, with regard to the U.S. troops in the Middle East, and in Saudi Arabia especially, I think most Muslims would definitely would not like to see any foreign troops controlling the sacred land of Islam. <clears throat> this is a very important point, and I think the Muslims are not going to compromise on that point. Any prolongation of foreign troops, whether friendly or enemy, uh, in Saudi Arabia is definitely a challenge to the Muslim world and the Muslims are not going to accept it beyond the point of tolerance. And the point of tolerance is seeing to it that the Kuwaitis are given their right to self-determination and at the same time killings and the violation <coughs> of the dignity of the average Kuwaiti man and woman is not pursued mm -hmm. any further. I think this is a very important point. The, the third point I'd like to bring to the attention of the larger community here is that uh, there is a thin line between anti-Saddam Hussein and pro-Saddam Hussein in the Islamic world. And you have seen strange bedfellows in the Middle East with regard to support for Saddam Hussein. I'm very surprised personally to see some of the uh, Muslim brothers, the Ahwan Muslimin, dancing with Saddam Hussein at this particular point in time, when we know very well what the Ba'at have done to the Ahwan Muslimin historically in the region. So for that point, American position, I mean, policymakers and strategists should recognize the fact that there is a thin line between love and hate. And uh, this must be made very categorically clear. So you must, President Bush must walk that thin line very cautiously so as to make sure that the overwhelming majority of the Muslims are on his side. Otherwise, any mistake in the misuse of American power could trigger a reaction. Mohamed, uh how do you say this? Yes, I feel that we are looking here at basically two occupation situations. One is the overt occupation of Kuwait by Iraq. And then we are looking also at, from the perception of the popular Muslims in the world, a de facto occupation by the United States of the Gulf. And I think that there are elements in that we should all look at. And that uh, very, very US presence <coughs> masks a hidden agenda. For example, you have you are, you are coming into an issue which again uh, brings into focus the Palestinian Zionist conflict, which was at the central uh, center of the Middle East conflict. Then you are seeing this cleavage between the plutocrats of the Arab world, the very wealthy families, and those the have-nots. Then we are seeing another situation that uh, tremendous polarization of Islam versus the West. 
But interestingly, one has to look at the U.S. role. And I think that by having the USA come into the Gulf in such force and in such fury, a great mistake has been made by Muslim people that we have inadvertently accepted the doctrine of United States use of force in the hinterland of the Muslim <clears throat> world. And that doctrine can be applied against anybody because once you accept somebody as a regional policeman, which we have effect, in effect and implicitly accepted, things are going to be very difficult. As for Saddam, Saddam was, uh, I see very little difference but what Saddam was doing 10 years ago and what he was doing now. But the only difference it started was that, please notice that about two months ago, I think that he threatened uh, Israel with chemical weapons. And only then the demonization of Saddam started in the US press. So that Israel is becoming a significant beneficiary of this dispute. And what, let us say <coughs> at, at the end of it, what if, for example, America is able to defeat Iraq militarily and remove Saddam? What then? I think a host of new confrontations will start. Okay, before we go into that, I would like to address uh, <coughs> Professor Jafar Sheikh Idris. And let's go to basics first. What is the process of dealing with conflicts between Muslims? It started between two Arab Muslim states. What is the process if this was an Islamic process? It's a very <coughs> first, uh, the Quran explains this. Uh, if I may read it in Arabic and then. وَإِنْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَدُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِنْ بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيهَا إِلَى أَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ فَاءَتْ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِالْعَدْلِ وَأَقْصِطُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْصِدِينَ uh, the, the verse says that if two groups of parties or whatever of Muslims fight, then try to reconcile them. Um, if one of them commits an act of aggression against the other, then you fight the one, this one, which commits the act of aggression until it uh, surrenders to the word of, of God. And then if it does, then you try again to reconcile them, reconcile them, and you must be just in this because Allah loves those who are just. So um, I am glad that um, uh, what the brother said, uh, the brothers here said about the Arabs and Muslims in the United States, that there is a kind of consensus um, um, uh, uh, on what uh, um, uh, on um, uh, uh, on the fact that what um, Saddam did or Iraq did was was wrong. It was morally wrong. And uh, I felt very sad um, to find. Um, Muslims in so many parts of the world not doing this. They are not condemning this act as an, uh, an immoral one. Um, so if we want to solve the uh, problem uh, according to Islam, that is, uh, that is the way. OK, before getting into the economics of what led Saddam to do so, I will go back to Jim and Jawad and if say, Yes. I want to correct just one yeah, point. I, mean. I, I don't think that the Muslim brothers danced with <laughs> Saddam. And because I, 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 I happen to know that um, and to have read some of the statements which were made in different parts of the Arab world about this, I think their mistake is that they put too much emphasis on, just like the brother here, <laughs> they put too much emphasis on uh, the, uh, on, on the on on the on on the American presence yes. in Saudi Arabia, but I think they did condemn the uh, the invasion. The invasion. Mm -hmm. Yes, before getting in the economics, Professor Safa, uh, Jim, did according to the verse, this is an issue that could have been dealt between Arabs and Muslims. Did the Arabs get their chance to solve this problem? There is a feeling that the United States moved a little bit too quickly. How do you react to that? I don't know if I can second guess that. Uh, what I can say is that there was a negotiating effort taking place in Riyadh, in, in Jeddah. Mm -hmm. And you have conflicting reports. The Kuwaitis say the offer was on the table. Saddam walked out and eight hours later invaded 
the Iraqis say, uh, we went to negotiate. Uh, the Kuwaitis waved at us uh, the fact that uh, they had uh, the support of, uh, of strength of America. And we went out and eight hours later invaded. What, what is irrefutable <laughs> is that eight hours after the first session, uh, Iraq invaded. <clears throat> and I think that regardless of which story is accepted, the fact of the invasion broke the negotiating process and, uh, and, and ushered in the period that we're, we're, we're dealing with right now. <clears throat> and so it, it's sort of the situation of, of walking down the street and seeing George Foreman uh, maybe he makes a snarl in your face or, or says something about your mother. You are tempted to hit him in the nose, but what you know is that one minute later you're going to be dead. It's a question of, of, of Iraq invading, unleashing the process that the world community is now responding to with outrage, with horror, and with a certain amount of, of, of the threat of force. I am confident that there's not going to be force. I feel uh, that uh, there's saber rattling, but that in the end, there is a negotiating process that will yet take place. Some facts are non-negotiable. In the world community, not, not me or, or anyone else says that. The world community says the restoration of Kuwait is non-negotiable. The withdrawal from Kuwait is non-negotiable. But the issues that were on the table before this nightmare began can be put back on the table after uh, a, and I think the Quranic verse is, is perfect in that regard, because after there is a pulling back, and I think that there will be a pulling back when we tire of rattling the sabers at each other, when the sanctions begin to work, we can go back and try to resolve those issues, and I think that those issues can be resolved. But the non-negotiable demands of the world community must first be implemented. And, and in addition, we've now entered a third factor, and that is this, uh, this horror of taking foreigners, uh, yes, yes. which is un-Islamic, it is un-Arab, and, and is personally human, presenting human. us with a, yeah. with, a, with, a, with a nightmare. We'll come to that issue, but my, I just my question. Make, I just want to make one, one caveat here, and that is that with regard to the U.S. position, the Saudis say, uh, affirmed that they invited the U.S. president, and the president announced a limited U.S. involvement in a defensive deployment of international forces. Uh, for four principles. The four principles we have supported. And we've supported the international presence with the U.S. as a part of it. And in fact, there is an international presence today. There's 40,000 U.S. troops, and 65,000 Saudi troops, and 5,000 Egyptians, 12,000 more in the way, and Syrians, and, and, and Bangladesh, and Pakistani, et cetera, forces there. What I fear is that the U.S. does not understand two factors. One is its credibility problem in the region, which is, in fact, the double standard is now provoking a response. And secondly, that the extent to which we overplay our hand, we jeopardize the four principles in the first place. We should not, as Americans, be making this conflict, Saddam Hussein versus George Bush, which is what we're doing, and therefore playing into the hands of those who want to see this as America versus. We have to be operating in the context of an international resolve, which I understand is firm and consistent and universally accepted. What he did was wrong. Sanctions have been applied. We ought to give them time to work with resolve to hold them in place, and then allow this negotiating process to take place on the other principles, but not the non-negotiable principles of the restoration of Kuwait with its legitimate government and a pullback of forces. Uh, my, my real question, Jawad, was after the invasion, there is a feeling in the Arab American community, maybe in the Muslim American community, that the Arab world did not take enough time to grasp the whole situation and try to put something into that. The fact of the matter that the American deployment started and then came in the Arab League resolution. So, did the Arab world get a chance to look into this case? Well, given, given the facts of, first of all, Saddam Hussein assuring the world community that he was not going to invade <coughs> into Kuwait, uh, which was a lie, and his invasion, and given the fact of the amassing of Iraqi troops on the Saudi border, it was evidence of, again, a further uh, escalation of the conflict. Saddam Hussein again was saying, I'm not going into Saudi Arabia, but his, 
his credibility was already shot given what happened with respect to Kuwait. And he was moving troops beyond Kuwait City down to the so, southern border, right. which to caused to the concern. Border, to the neutral the zone. Side. Yes. And I think that um, while in the best possible world, if there was more time, perhaps there could have been, but given the facts, and given the fact that he had just misrepresented himself to the entire world prior to going into Kuwait, but the United States couldn't afford to take that chance and in fact had to move. And, uh, and <coughs> even Saudi Arabia couldn't uh, <laughs> take that chance. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because they see these uh, troops on the on their borders, they they know they know more than anyone else what happened to the to the, to the Kuwaitis. They, it would have been very unwise on their part to take um, to take any chance. And you have to again <coughs> bear in mind that the United States was responding to the request of Saudi Arabia, which is one of our requests. And it is, in fact, the Saudis who made the determination that now is the time for the deployment and, of American and, forces. And reluctantly so. And I reluctantly, think that, you yes. know, that one of the things that has sort of bothered me in the discussion is that it is sometimes presented as an American intervention, which skews the language in a manner to, to pose it as, in fact, one, one group uh, has called it, condemned the unilateral U.S. <coughs> intervention. Well, in fact, there was a U.S. In, there was an invitation, which I believe, was an invitation uh, and was U.S. participating in what, in fact, has become a, a rather interesting, as you suggest, Suleiman, uh, international force. I mean, you have Syrians and you have Egyptians and you have the United States and you have the Bangladeshis and you have the. Um, but in, in this situation, I think this should be made uh, while we all condemn Saddam's uh, invasion, but we should not be condoning some other aspects in this. See, a very brutal invasion took place in uh, June 1982 by Israel of uh, Lebanon. And no, you know, con no condoning of that at all. The point was that uh, that, uh, that invasion, <laughs> Brother al okay. that invasion was abetted by no lesser person than the U.S. Secretary of State. Paid for, supported. Uh, Alexander, yeah. Alexander Haig. And up. on June sure. 7, 1982, sure. the, US Security, uh, the U.N. Security Council passed a resolution condemning and threatening Israel with mm -hmm. sanctions. And there was one country which mm -hmm. opposed that. I will, I will come to that and point, but in my... Uh, the enormous credibility problem that we have and that we've not dealt with, and I think it is incumbent upon the U.S. at this we'll, juncture, yeah, we'll in come. order to strengthen our credibility in the region, to respond to that and to make an affirmative, an affirmative move on the issue of Palestinian See, we have, rights. We are, just, uh, we are missing one other thing, that this is the one step of the series of armed actions taken against Muslim countries in the last decade. We uh, saw that in Lebanon in 82, we saw that against Syria, we saw that against uh, Iran, we saw that against Libya, and now we are seeing it, seeing it, Russians did it to Afghanistan, now we are seeing it, uh, although it's in, in a, it's in Saudi Arabia, but yeah. it's against... Right. We'll come to that. Let me get into the <coughs> economics a little bit and give uh, Dr. Safa a chance. Dr. Safa, there is a notion <coughs> that Iraq was, was cornered to take such a move. Uh, there are people who say that Iraq tried to work through OPEC in dealing with the oil problem. How desperate was Iraq to go to such a serious move into invading Kuwait, economically, if you will? Well, you know that Iraq came back after eight years of fighting with Iran, and the treasury of Iraq was practically empty. Mm -hmm. Iraq wanted some resources from somewhere, and Kuwait was a ready price. Obviously, Saddam has guessed that he's not going to stay in Kuwait for a long period of time. But again, having access to the Kuwaiti oil, even for a limited period of time, would help Saddam's treasury tremendously. But now that there is an embargo, how would it help it? Well, he, of course, did not uh, think that there is going to be a general consensus among the international community that there will be sanctions and a total embargo against Iraq. He didn't count on that. What he was thinking that after taking Kuwait, perhaps some dust will be raised by some countries in the region, and eventually the whole thing will fade. Mm -hmm. And he will continue occupying <coughs> Kuwait for as long as he could, and uh, of course utilize the oil resources. OK, I would like to address another issue here. And uh, Professor Jafar Sheikh Idris, the issue of foreigners prisoners or even prisoners of war. What is the Islamic position in the treatment of foreigners 
or prisoners or prisoners of war. Uh, <coughs> Islam is very clear on this. Even in, even in actual um, even in actual fighting, uh, according to the Prophet, you should not kill anyone. Uh, you can make a def the general definition. Anyone who does not take active part in the fighting, or who is not able to do this, like um, children and, uh, and women. And also said um, people, religious people who are in the um, uh, religious uh, places and so on. So even, even if you are um, on war with another country, you take every precaution not to kill innocent people, people who are not your actual enemies in, in the battle. And when it comes, of course, to uh, prisoners uh, of war, uh, it, it becomes very obvious because uh, these are um, helpless people. Uh, they are not doing anything. Perhaps some of them might be even against their, <laughs> their government. Uh, so why, why, do you, why do you? Yeah, I think that's a very important point. And I think you, know, you can see that uh, this is a point which has been latched onto by President Bush and some of his uh, advisors in the sense that uh, they're trying to show very clear to the Muslim world, and I guess to the American Muslim uh, community and to the larger American society, that non-combatants mm. should not be mm. an issue in any kind of conflict, no. whether it is a cold war or a hot war. Mm. And I think <laughs> this is a point I think most American Muslims uh, would uh, take Saddam Hussein to task mm. on. And I think uh, he has to be and critically, I mean, uh, and, and Arab Americans too. I mean, it is not a part of Arab culture or civilization. No. This also. And I and and just one second. I think one of the things that is one of one of my employees mm. from uh, from our institute mm. is uh, is currently uh, one of the people mm. uh, who is uh, uh, trapped, and we have received uh, numbers of calls mm. from Arab Americans whose husbands or wives are trapped and children are trapped there. Because the, who are the people, after all, who are working in Kuwait and in yes, Iraq? Yeah. They're Americans who, who have loved the people, mm. who've worked with the people. It's, it's the same tragedy as the Americans' hostages in Lebanon. These are people who, if you look at each of them, many of them are married to Lebanese. Mm. And most of them are missionaries or teachers who are dedicated and committed to the people. <coughs> the American business community there and the Americans who are, 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 are living in those countries are married to to Arabs in those countries are people who love the country and the people. And so it is, it is, it is almost uh, inconceivable how this is taking place. And I am convinced that the Iraqi people cannot be happy or accepting this because they live with these Americans, they work with these Americans, they must be horribly embarrassed and frustrated that these people who they've known and loved and have worked with um, but at the are, same time, Jim, we should not, uh, we should basically, I think there's always a mistake in this country sometimes when there's a threatening situation that uh, we arrogate a higher status to Western lives and give, mm. assign a lower status mm. to Muslim lives. Mm. The people who are going to suffer the most in this entire crisis are going to be the innocent Iraqi Muslims. Yeah. And let's not forget, this is an extremely vital point that the most of the casualties, mm -hmm. if the war is going to happen, are going to happen to Muslims. Yeah. Iraqi Muslims. Yeah. And this can inflame the situation beyond the control of anybody, sure. beyond the control of Arab establishment, mm -hmm. beyond the control of uh, United States, and beyond the control of Israel, who I understand, because George Ball has just said that Israel is playing a very key behind the scenes role. And they want <coughs> the United States to mop up Iraq. Yeah, okay. We'll come to that. But yeah. let me ask you this, uh, yes, Mohad. Yeah. Can Mrs. Tarchel yesterday uh, told Saddam Hussein how can he put a veil of women and children and hide behind that veil. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a valid statement and is he hiding behind the veil of women and children or is he making use of those hostages there mm -hmm. in the best way any president or any uh, person in his situation would be? In fact, it's an excellent question. I commend you. In, uh, today is a very good article in the New York Times which talks about the uses and misuses of hostages in war. Mm. Unfortunately, war is a very brutalizing experience. The mm. British have been doing that. They've done it in India. They've used hostages. They've done it in North Africa. Mm. The Romans did it. The Greeks did it. In fact, if there's a recently a book has come out on Islamic jurisprudence. Mm. And it's written by a Hindu by the name of Professor Veera Mantri based in uh, Australia. And he said that basically that the humanitarian principles of conflict, which the West has always said have emanated from the principles of Grotius and other Western scholars, 
have actually originated from the practices of Islam. Yes, when the Crusaders came to co uh, contact with the Muslims. And Saladin as was always renowned, the man who contested against uh, this Western yes. imperialism uh, in the Middle Ages, he was renowned for his chivalry. So I think that we should also realize, let us say that how has the West behaved in a time of stress? In 1941, when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed, Japanese Americans holding American passports, being fully American in all senses of the word, and with no claim or suggestions of disloyalty, they were rounded up, relocated, and excluded illegally and unconstitutionally. Wait, wait one second. So, but this what, wait, wait one second. The, the, no, point, I'm, the point I'm making is yeah. the point I'm making is what Saddam is doing is very bad. Right. It's wrong. But it has been done by other people also, by the Westerners and anybody else. Do you justify no, it? I do not justify it. Right. I no. completely no. condemn no. it. Right. But I also feel that there are 17 million Iraqi lives which have been held hostage. Also. Okay. Let's no, also say there's no question. Let's let's there's no, I just okay. want to. I just want to take yeah. issue with you though. No one is arrogating to Western life a value mm. higher than. I mean, we died with each Lebanese and Palestinian who mm. died in that Israeli invasion. Mm -hmm. They have behaved brutally. And, 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 and in a, in a manner that is almost unforgivable. Similarly, the Iran-Iraq war saw horrors and nightmares on both sides. And America in Grenada was wrong. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. America in Vietnam, I did not support. No one is justifying the behavior <coughs> of one with the other, I hope. Because what we're facing right. here is an issue of the taking of Westerners and others, not just Westerners, Japanese and, and others <coughs> in a situation which they have no making, no participation, and in fact have been in Iraq building the economy of that country. Mm -hmm. I fear that as an Arab, we will find it difficult to relate to these various ethnic groups, these various national groups, as we seek their support to build our countries and work with us in the future. It is not the way we ought to be behaving as our culture. I am not insulted as an American. I'm insulted as an Arab because this is not the behavior I expect. But why are people. we equating? Okay. We are making weird okay. One, one, one point. point. Let's, it's a very valid point. We'll, we'll come to it. Okay. We'll, come to it. Let's 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 we'll come to it. We'll come to it. I think we should not fall into the trap of equating Muslim misconduct with the practices of Islam. All right. But there's another trap. We'll come to it. Why? Let's let's hear. Before Jawad goes in, Jawad, let me ask you a question. I'm pressing this issue because it's something that we need to clarify. What is the position of the American government if or if there were no hostages, what would the chances of war be? And now that there are hostages, what are the chances of war? Okay, I will get to that question. Okay, go ahead. We were talking about yeah. victims and, yeah. and who were the real victims. Let us not forget the people of Kuwait who are the true victims. Exactly. Who right now are suffering the brutalization of the Iraqi forces as well. Mm -hmm. And who if there's and, and if there's finance for Iraq and made him what he is today. That's right. Okay. And and Let's if there is that. if, if there it. is military action, it will mainly be Kuwaiti soil that's going to be <coughs> fought over. No, okay. All right, let, let's necessary. get to this but question. I'd like, I'd like to get to the to to the to the broader issue is mm -hmm. uh, would there be uh, are the prospects of military action on this country, would they be greater if there were no hostages? Mm -hmm. I think that probably they are greater. Uh, I think that the hostages are a bargaining chip that are being used by Saddam Hussein and that but for them I think the United States would be more likely to actually uh, invade uh, the region. Okay, yeah. let, me, let me get to another issue. Uh, it has seen that the reaction of the masses, the Arab masses and the Muslims masses there, uh, Professor Niang talked about the Muslim Brotherhood or the masses there rejoicing Iraq. My understanding is before the U.S. deployment, uh, nobody was condoning what Iraq did. It. And if history can go back, nobody. But as soon as the U.S. moved in, the masses moved and react, maybe sometimes even not coinciding with the governments. My question is, why is it whenever America does anything, the Arabs and the Muslims masses react so fast. Yeah, well, I think you know, I, I think Jim uh, and, uh, and George here uh, uh, hit the nail on the head. It's the moral hypocrisy that is a question of perception. Mm -hmm. There is this pervasive perception in the Muslim world and Arab world that the United States is a hypocrite in the political world, and that when the United States sees wrong done by Israel, it gives the blind eye. But when Muslim and Arab interests are violated, then the United States uh, 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 does not uh, do what it's supposed to do. Now, this is one of the reasons why we have serious problems in the Middle East. 
In the Middle East, you have tragedy of errors. Here, on the, at, the moral play, at, the, at the moral level, the United States, in the eyes of the Muslim world, and, I, and, and I'm so also in the eyes of many Arabs, or most Arabs, uh, condones whatever aggression is carried out by Israel or any other Western country against people of Arab or Muslim origin. At the same time, in the West, the United States is believed by the Muslims, these are Muslim perceptions now, and Arab perceptions, uh, does not give any kind of legitimacy or support to whatever is done by Arabs or Muslims. These are points which must be borne in mind. So in the eyes of the Muslim world, and in the Arab world, uh, there is this belief that America is a moral hypocrite in the international arena. Now, of course, this is not a point accepted by American policymakers and the majority of American people, because when America deals with the rest of the world, there is that American strain in foreign policy which is moralistic. If you are a, mm -hmm. if you are a student of American uh, foreign policy, you link with this the Jeffersonian school, as opposed to the Hamiltonian school, <laughs> wielding the big stick. So I mean, the carrot and the stick has been played out very effectively. You see, we are not saying, in condemning Saddam Hussein's aggression against Kuwait, and I agree with George, we have to condemn Saddam Hussein for taking Kuwait. The reality is this, the modern Arab state system and the modern Muslim state system accept national boundaries. These are Western concepts which in the old Islamic understanding of nationalities and peoples did not count. But we are living in the 20th century and as we move into the 21st century, the national identity is a fact. We cannot tell the Kuwaitis that Kuwait was part of Iraq at one point. So for that reason, Iraq can use big force and move into Kuwait and therefore the Kuwaiti identity disappears like uh, a dew in the morning. That is not reality. We have to recognize the identity of the Kuwaitis. At the same time, we have to understand the reaction of the Muslim masses. The Muslim masses really oppose American presence in the region, even if it is against Saddam Hussein, when their interest is perceived to be violated by America beating on Saddam Hussein. So the most important thing is Saddam Hussein would be dealt with by the Iraqi people, and I believe the Day of Judgment is not far away, uh, by his own people, and I think that is much more effective than any American <coughs> force. And I see uh, uh, James' point that maybe, and we pray to God to bring that about, the conflict will be resolved without any kind of bloodshed, because if there is bloodshed, Muslim lives but will go. the very size of the U.S. deployment itself portends an offensive strike. Let me come to you, uh, Please, Moad. Against Iran. Um, uh, I talked about Arab message and Muslim message. Mm -hmm. Frankly, within the Arab world mm -hmm. is what we heard. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear anything within the Muslim message outside the Arab world. Mm -hmm. Where is the reaction of the Muslim message outside the Arab world mm -hmm. in Pakistan, in Malaysia, and others? be it masses or governments, and what's their reaction? The government in Pakistan, basically, I can talk, Pakistan is a very key state. It's uh, <coughs> the back door of the Gulf, and it's uh, got a half a million prof highly professional standing army, and has been the flag bearer of pan-Islamism. Now, Pakistan has done something in, in uh, this crisis that, uh, which is incongruent with the popular feelings of the masses for tactical reasons, that they wanted to, they are sending troops to Saudi Arabia which I think basically is number one, that they do not want the United States to apply any meaningful pressure for elections to be held, which could give an opportunity for Benazir to come back. And secondly, Pakistan itself is facing a tremendous pressure from its flank with India over the up uprising, the Muslim uprising in Kashmir. And they feel that this could be an extremely invaluable IOU, a precious quid pro quo, that in case uh, India tries to attack Pakistan, Pakistan can always encash on that IOU. And the American military presence is already in that region. But it, have, it takes me, your question is a very good one, it takes me to 56, when Nasser seized the Suez Canal. Pakistani government again took a position which was consistent with the British. But the masses, are not, Nasser was not a popular figure. Because of the fact that he was a Muslim, that pan-Islamic feeling came up. And it emerged. And the same thing is happening now. People do not admire Saddam. They have followed his career for the last 10 years. They saw what he did to Iran. And they saw that they have a good idea what he has done to his own people. And ultimately, his own people have been the biggest victims. But they suddenly find this new discovered 
U.S. Uh, love for defending, becoming a defender of the faith in, in the holy soil, because they are two very, they, four of the most significant, two of, of the most emotionally significant religious shrines are involved in Hijaz, Mecca and Medina, and in Iraq, Karbala and Najaf. So I think that the consequences of any flare-up, which I think are inevitable, because the decision to go to war with Iraq has already been taken, and it's portended by the scale of deployment, could be devastating, not only for America, but for, also for the Arab establishment. See, by being seen popularly of these Arab establishment governments being propped up by US help would ultimately discredit them and may even speed up their overthrow. So these are all things we have to basically uh, let me them. Let me fr be frank and maybe ask here, Dr. Jaffer. Um, the Muslim masses did not move outside the Arab world. Is it because really this U.S. deployment is very far away from Mecca and Medina? And how do you take it in contrast with the, when Mecca was besieged in the early 80s and when Imam Khomeini came at that time and he said, America is behind it, and people in Pakistan rioted and they went through the embassy. My question is, really, frankly, is the Muslim world or the Muslim world did not react until now because it does not think that this deployment yet affects the Muslim sacred places yeah, I'll, maximum. I'll quickly. Let I, me I think so. I think I agree. I, I, uh, because the people, uh, I mean, the first um, people who should feel the danger are the people who are living in Mecca and Medina. And they should seek the help of, of other Muslims and tell them that we are uh, in danger of being invaded by the United States, so come to our help. But since they didn't do that, um, the Muslims um, in other parts of the, of the world have every um, right not to feel that there is, um, uh, the, the, these two holy places are not in, uh, in any But danger. I saw yesterday in the CNN that they were cooking pork in the Holy Land in Saudi Arabia. And in you, Saudi Arabia, you see, not all Saudi Arabia Islamic, Holy Islamic Land. law has to apply across the board, and it has applied. So we are just creating a situation where we are carving out an exception for Islamic law. You are having women basically operating in T-shirts, women driving jeeps, people reading pornography, people drinking beer, people eating pork, and the perception. Of course, there are technical nice distinctions, but the perceptions that an exception has been carved out can be devastating for the legitimacy of the House of Saudi. Okay, let me let me come to uh, take us back again to economy. How is the world economy affected here, or how will it be affected? <coughs> well, it depends upon so many factors. Number one, uh, we have to look at by how much the other OPEC countries are going to increase their production. Because definitely right now there is a deficit of 20% of the OPEC oil in the market, which is going to result in increased prices. However, should the rest of the OPEC member countries increase their output by 20%, obviously it's not going to affect the oil price. However, beyond that, we also have to look at the ability of the governments uh, to the extent that they can prevent price gouging because the oil <coughs> companies are obviously utilizing the situation right now. For example, the high prices of gasoline that we are paying right now, this oil was extracted like about nine months ago, which was purchased at a very cheap price, but we are paying like uh, two times the amount that we are supposed to pay for that oil. Is by the United States by going in that region, okay. is it controlling the um, world economy? Would they through this controlling of the oil there? Are they controlling Japan or Europe? I don't think that is uh, true because uh, the reason why the United States went there was definitely to uh, defend the United States' vital interest, which is oil. Mm -hmm. However, there was no intention on the part of the United States to go and invade or you know, bring troops there to control the oil supply because the United States was getting oil very cheap from that region. They did not have any reason to <coughs> go and uh, occupy the region. Does this mean that Please. they really only went for their vital interest and not because they have their good relations with Kuwait and Saudi Arabia? Well, I think what is the bottom line here? Jeff? Well, I think the good relations with Saudi Arabia and Kuwait are a factor of why they went. Mm -hmm. I think to ensure the continuous flow of oil is a factor. I think the principles of international law that we talked about earlier are factors. I mean, I think all of that was taken into account. 
in terms of the decision to, to go into Saudi Arabia. Okay. I'd like to, I'd I'd like like to play that. Can I say yes, like, Jim. I'd like to, yes, Jim. I'd like to, go ahead. To, to play that out a bit. I think that, that the issue here on all sides is a function of, of how the case is, is being made. If the case is made, oil and our way of life, we're on very weak ground in terms of our ability to win the hearts and minds of people here and in the region. If the case is made, as the President did in the outset, for principles, it's a strong moral ground. And while it may be, and is in fact, this is uh, not a consistent adherence to principle, the ability to argue the case on the ground of principle and to function in the context of an international consensus can work. Where we've miscalculated is the lack of credibility in the region. Where we've miscalculated is because of the lack of credibility, in particular on the question of Palestine and Lebanon. We have seen a reaction in the masses that is a function of the degree of alienation in those masses from the existing order. We have X number of troops on one side, Saddam Hussein, hey, Saddam Hussein has X number of troops on the other side, and we're facing each other. Meanwhile, he's going over our heads to the Arab masses, and he is appealing on legitimate historical grievances, inflaming them. The danger is that the extent to which America's head sticks up too high in this, and the President continues to have press conferences and, and, and mobilize American opinion on the grounds that we're going to go and what, whatever, and function outside of the context of the international community. We make it America versus Saddam Hussein. That will continue to inflame the situation. And at the same time, the extent to which we do not deal with our credibility problem on the question of Palestine and on the question of Lebanon, we further increase the danger of destabilization in the region. The reason I say that is because if the four purposes are the reason we went there, and I believe that they ought to be, we run the risk of taking, if we take precipitous action or unilateral action or function us versus him, we run the risk of jeopardizing the very four reasons we went in there for and inflaming the region, destabilizing the region, and not being able to save the principles that we've gone in for. We need to affirm principle consistently across the board. A gesture from the administration today affirming the right of Palestinians to self-determination would so alter the political map of that region that it would make the accomplishing of those four objectives serious. And I think that we ought to look and press for that. We ought to press for no military action. We ought to oppress, <coughs> impress upon the administration the necessity of being consistent on principle. We ought to impress on the administration the need to affirm operating in the international consensus and giving the sanctions a chance to work because I think they can work. If we want to save Kuwait, which we do, and restore it, and defend stability in the Gulf, and preserve our allies in the region, then we must function in a manner consistent with those objectives. Can I quickly add two footnotes to your yeah. very in, in illuminating discourse? Just two very quick points. The first is the question of principles. I think the last time the United States deployed forces massively was in Vietnam. And it was through Professor Nyang, is a very scholarly man, was I think through the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, yes. was it not? And I met uh, Senator Fulbright about 15 years ago, and he told me that Johnson lied the United States what Congress. Is, this and this incident was cooked up as a pretext for America, as an excuse to move into it. And then uh, Zogby, of course, is a good friend of mine. We know him for the last decade or so. I had the privilege of uh, working with him also. That he made a very good point that America should also try to put pressure on Israel to give justice, because that's a very central Muslim justice. precept justice. to the Palestinians. But I find it difficult uh, to buy that, because Israel is behind, very clearly behind. And it stands to benefit immensely from this American military presence. We'll come to the issue of Israel later. Yes. Uh, I think there are certain uh, facts which have, uh, have to be stated clearly. Um, I think the first fact is that America is not there just to defend moral principles. I mean, uh, many Americans acknowledge this. The Saudis know this. America, you know, whatever uh, other motives it has, it is there to serve, uh, safeguard its interests. But it, um, no. this, it is this point which confuses so many Muslims. They think that whatever is in, inter, in, the, in, in, in the interest of the United States, 
must be against this. And I think it is here that we have to be uh, cool and, and <laughs> rational, yeah. because that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, follow all the time. In this particular case, it happened that uh, uh, America was on the right side of the, of the, of the moral issue. And they uh, exploited that. Now, uh, the Saudis, and there, there's another fact, that according to Islam, no non-Muslim should be in those places. The so no, n neither the Haram no, nor the so. Riyadh, yeah. yeah. not every, That's not right. any place. Yeah. And I think also it is a fact that no country, whether it, is, it be Islamic or non-Islamic, would like to find itself in a position to seek the help of others, whether they be friends or foes. And people do this only when it is really necessary. Desperation. Uh, yes. Desperation. And now the uh, and I think. Many people in Saudi Arabia now, they must be very sad that uh, they had to seek the help of, of, of the United States. But um, they, I mean, the, the, the ulama in Saudi Arabia said very clearly that this is a, point, this is a matter of necessity. I mean, uh, for the, according to the, the normal rules of Islam, there should be no non-Muslim, especially troops, in, in, in those places. But this is a matter of, of, of necessity. And I think that um, um, instead of um, emphasizing this part of the problem, that the, the Americans went to Saudi Arabia and so on, we should emphasize the other part, uh, which is uh, in our, uh, uh, we are in a position to solve uh, as Arabs and as Muslims. And that is to. Uh, to tell Saddam Hussein to withdraw <coughs> from, uh, from Kuwait. Yeah, Kuwait. I mean, you can't say right. uh, uh, all the Iraqis are held uh, hostage uh, uh, while you can save them. Mm -hmm. huh? yeah. I mean, if they are not held hostage yeah. and because you can withdraw and say, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I realized that, uh, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> uh, that this, was, um, this is going to bring more evil than the, the, the benefit that I thought I would uh, gain by um, uh, invading uh, Kuwait. Now I am, um, uh, I am exposing all the uh, Muslim yeah. world, including the holy places, to uh, <laughs> invasion by the United States yes. or the West or whatever. In one yeah. bold gesture, yes. Yes. One bold gesture yes. he can restore Arab unity, yes. free Kuwait, yes. end the crisis, yes. free the Western hostages, and demand uh, a, a, a moral response from America on other principles, but yes. he must he must take he must take the stand. And I think and, all yeah. the Muslims should. Uh, and I should think he has the ability to do it. Yes, he needs but to have. Jim, I think he needs to have Jim, the, he the has vision. Been, to do okay, it. Jim. But let me uh, let me just let me just hear, make a point. Yes. Many yes. Muslims, yes. Are not many people and Arabs are not we'll come to that point. Yes. Yes. Because they are now telling him that what you did is uh, is good. And he feels that if he withdraws, then this will not be. Uh, Very good. We'll come to that point. Dignified. Yes. Uh, Clearly, I think, you know, the problem, I think uh, we may be missing a point here. I mean, we, we go back, we can look at this whole thing in terms of principles. You know, if you look at it in the, uh, from the point of view of principles, uh, you will definitely uh, condemn <laughs> the parties that are involved in this crisis. I mean, because uh, morally, as we already discovered in our discussion, I mean, uh, there are so many inconsistencies in the pursuit of principles that uh, <laughs> one uh, would say that uh, injustice has suffered. Now, looking at it strictly from an Islamic point of view, the whole notion of social justice becomes very critical. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that needs to be borne out, and I think uh, uh, my friend here uh, alluded to it, uh, and that is we are not paying much attention to the consequences of mm -hmm. the American presence in the region. In the Arab world, there have been two tendencies battling for primacy, the spirit of republicanism and the spirit of monarchism. This is a reality in the Arab world, and it must be dealt with. Now, pan-Arabism has been an attempt to create a sense of unity among Arabs, regardless of whatever political or social system <coughs> prevails in individual Arab countries. What is happening now is that, ironically, America's presence in Saudi Arabia could very well plant the seed of republicanism in that country. This is something which may be far-fetched, but it could very well be one of the consequences of America's presence in that area. Because, you see, people will begin to entertain republican notions 
because of Americans themselves, wittingly or unwittingly, planting it. Now, if America stays there for a short time, this would not be the case. If America stays there for a long time, then the American presence, or what some Saudis might call the American virus, uh, would become contagious. And, uh, and this has implications for the future of that region, not only in Saudi Arabia, but throughout the Gulf. What I'm saying is, as Muslims looking at the problem in the Middle East, we can look at it from the point of view of principles. We can look at it from the point of real politic. Saddam Hussein is a fox, very Machiavellian in this case. He used pan-Arabism against Iran. Now he is using pan-Islamism against America and Kuwait. So I mean, you know, like this is something that must be borne in mind. So if we look at it in the, from the point of view of real politics, what we have to say is, America went into the area because of the four principles outlined by President Bush. And for that reason, President Bush was spelling out principles for which he knew very well the majority of the international community will rally around him. And we see that at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is this. If the Muslim world is seriously interested in a solution to the conflict, mm -hmm. and we didn't hear many voices in the Muslim world, they should put pressure on Saddam Hussein mm -hmm. to withdraw from Kuwait yes. and to restore the Sabah family. Mm -hmm. Now, many of these Muslim governments are non-democratic. And this is a point that must be made Absolutely. categorically clear. They are afraid of their masses. Right. So for that reason, if you're calling for democratic elections in Kuwait, the same principle must be applied across the board throughout the Muslim world. Most of those guys are dictators. And dictators right. ride on tigers, which they dare not dismount, as Churchill said. And the tigers are getting and, hungry. And part of the tragedy here is that while one would not call Kuwait a full-blown democracy, there was an element of pluralism there that was unmatched in many other countries in the area, a freer press than in most. In fact, the Kuwaiti press had become the international Arab press because uh, Al-Qabas, for example, had the most free uh, discussion of, of international issues. There were elections. There was the development of a constitutional reform movement. And there was an internal discussion <coughs> in the country that was moving the situation forward. It was not complete. And it was not in any way one would present it as an, an exhausted, full-blown democratic process. But it is a tragedy that that process that was beginning to evolve is now cut off. And Jordan as well, which has maybe the, the, at this time the most advanced democratic process in the region, is itself in danger of, right. of exploding right. because of this conflict. Uh, let so me address We don't uh, want to Jawad. see that loss. No, no. Uh, uh, let me ask you, Jawad, right. why I see here that uh, the, um, the distinguished gentlemen here are requesting Saddam Hussein to make the first move. Can't America now? Now that it is, it has not 40, but 80,000 uh, troops there, why doesn't America come with a gesture? It seems that there is a notion that they are putting so much pressure on Saddam Hussein well, that he might explode. Well, Can't America now come up with a gesture? It's Saddam Hussein who precipitated this crisis, who took the step, who took the aggressive action. I mean, the United States didn't have anything to do with that aggressive uh, invasion of Kuwait. Um, the 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 United States is, in effect, supporting the international consensus with respect to what needs to be there. And I don't think it's appropriate. I, I think that the United States, in its own interest, should make a gesture, as Jim had suggested, toward the Palestinians by saying they support the principle of self-determination and reaffirm that they want Israel to withdraw, to, uh, to again, develop greater support among the masses for, the, for their presence there. But I don't think it's up to the United States to make the first gesture. I think it's, I think Saddam Hussein is the person who has to make a gesture. Mohamed, what do you think? I feel it. I feel a very dangerous lineup is emerging in Muslim uh, popular perception. That they, people I've talked to, they feel uh, in Pakistan also. They feel that they see there's United States on one side, behind the United States is Israel, behind Israel is Arab establishment. On the other hand, they see disenfranchised Muslim masses who are bitter feel embattled and uh, feel very frustrated. I only wish that uh, whenever I see talks of Muslim unity and whenever I've seen the practical manifestation of Muslim unity, unfortunately it has been against own Muslims. We saw a Muslim unity displayed against Iran in 1980. And we should never forget that it was uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Now we are discussing these hard issues which really financed. E even Prince Bandar conceded uh, 
in 60 minutes, I think a week or two ago, when he was giving an interview, that uh, it was Saudi money which made Saddam. They gave billions, tens of billions of dollars. And he said, I never expected that he would do something like that. So we should, uh, what, and secondly, now we see, first we saw a unity against Iran. Now we are seeing the Muslim unity against, directed against Iraq. Both of those actions were Western approved. So my point is that why is there this alacrity, this in certain enthusiasm and rush to show Muslim united action against own Muslim brother, especially when the big brother is behind it? And why have we, the Muslims, and this is the question which should be asked from all Muslim governing elites, why has this same degree of commitment, energy, and determination not shown in resisting Zionist aggression, which is a tremendous source of humiliation? for all the Muslims, and which is at the core of the present crisis in the Muslim I don't world. understand your logic, Mohan, yeah. I must say. Well, I, I, I agree with your conclusion. Mm -hmm. Why has there not been a unified mm -hmm. stand, the same vigor and enthusiasm against the Israeli aggression, Lebanon, Syria, mm -hmm. West Bank, Gaza, Egypt, whatever? But, but, but I don't see, I mean, I would suggest to you the issue is not in this case Muslim unity or world condemnation against Saddam because the U.S. approves or encourages it, but because he invaded Kuwait and annexed Kuwait and has brutalized its people. So has, and it, so has Israel with the Palestinians. But, 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 but one does so not one excuse does the not other. Not. One does not excuse the other. U.S. went into Grenada. It was wrong, very wrong. We condemned it. Jim. But, but, but the point here is that when you look at the situation in its objective facts, are we to be silent in the face of what Saddam, you yourself said he should be condemned. But I, I would never support U.S. presence. But the issue I is would, not. I would make it very clear. I would never support U.S. presence, even through the invitation of any person, so does this to mean, attack does a this Muslim mean, nation. I'm totally against that but principle. This because I feel that tomorrow, when Muslim reassertion comes at full bloom, the principle has already been accepted, and there's no way we can stop it. Once what, the genie is out of it, what about the alternative? What about the situation? Exactly. Yeah. What was the alternative? Let's hold it. Let me. How, let Kuwait, me, uh, how do we restore Kuwait? Jim, let me I ask you a the, question. We have, we we have regional people? alternatives. There's an Arab League. We have pan-Islamic forces also there. They can be regenerated, and they could be garnered, and they could be focused. There's no need. I feel. I I am totally unconvinced. I feel that American presence in the Gulf defeats the principles of morality and good sense and also good politics. Mohit Shah, are you more concerned about Saddam Hussein himself or are you more concerned of what you call the 17 million hostages of Iraq or are you more concerned of Iraq as a power in the region? What is your legitimate concern? My concern is that I feel that it's about time that the Muslim world should be a power by its own right. I think it's about time we should stop playing the role of number two. I'll give you an example in America. We talk of Arabism all the time here. But the Arabs, at the same time, should not forget that the main source of, uh, of uh, prejudice against them is because of their association with Islamic identity. They are majority of the Israeli Jews are of Arabic origin. But there is not that degree of resentment against them in the West. Their sympathy. It's Islam which is seen as the main enemy. And with the end of the Cold War, we see this focus of demonizing the world of Islam. And we should not accept, however odious any Muslim regime may be, we should not accept any Western power, whether through invitation or through intervention, to come into our household and try to sort out our, our business. OK, Jim, uh, my question goes to you in this sense. Uh, yeah. you, you, uh, you, uh, you said that a gesture should be done. Why couldn't the other 12 Arab countries make some kind of demands to the United States to make the gesture you said? And do you feel that Saddam is the one who would come with the first step or the United States? Well, we're talking about two different planes of, 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 of activity at this point. Uh, I'm suggesting that America has a credibility <coughs> problem and that in order to resolve its credibility problem, in order to deny Saddam Hussein, his appeal for legitimacy, and to do the moral right consistent thing, America must make a statement and initiate a process. I mean, we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and it would be incumbent upon America at this point and extremely beneficial to resolving this conflict if we made, initiated the process 
leading to Palestinian self-determination, not the, the, the process, the phony process that we were sort of carrying out and dragging out for the last uh, 10, 15 years. On the other hand, what we're asking from Saddam Hussein and from the Iraqi government is not a gesture, but is compliance with international law and the consensus to unwind the situation on the other hand. I mean, the US could make its, its, uh, its, its process uh, uh, known. It could begin moving towards Palestinian self-determination. It could implement Palestinian self-determination. And Saddam Hussein is still going to be in, in Kuwait. And, and so there are two different levels here of, of, of behavior. As an American, I insist America do this. As an American who is concerned about the US presence, and I am concerned about the presence as a destabilizing factor, and concerned about the extent to which uh, efforts are made to utilize that, as Mawahid is doing uh, very well, playing to the same kind of, uh, of appeal that, uh, uh, that others are playing to, that there is a problem, and we need to somehow recognize the reality of our unpopularity and deal with it. But that does not mitigate in any way the responsibility of Saddam Hussein to move out of Kuwait immediately and to unwind the conflict. He can stop it. He can restore Arab unity. He can focus world attention on the question of Palestine. At the present time, holding Kuwait hostage, holding the, uh, the, the, all these hundreds of thousands of workers in the country hostage, he does not have the moral authority to do that. But how can, Jawad, how can, how it can? It is his. He, ha he controls the army that's occupying yeah. Kuwait. Yeah, he can but move But how it out. can the United States make this kind of gesture when the PLO and King Hussein are siding with, uh, with Saddam Hussein. Are they siding with Saddam Hussein? And would this make it difficult on the US here to come with a gesture on the Palestinian issue? Well, the, the US gesture needs to be directed to the Palestinians and a clear assertion of the right of Palestinians for self-determination and a clear assertion with perhaps a definite timetable for Israel, Israeli withdrawal. Now, the United States can do that irrespective of the positions of Jordan or Yasser Arafat as the, as the chairman of, of the PLO or the president of Palestine. Now, the positions of Jordan and, and uh, Arafat have been uh, not supportive of what the United States is doing in that particular region. Um, and there are differences with respect to what the United States is doing that other people feel as well. But that really isn't linked to what the United States needs to do on the basis of clear moral authority. <coughs> are are the, the positions of the PLO and King Hussein justifiable here? Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, like, uh, since we are speaking to the larger American audience and to the larger Muslim world, we have to really look at the interests of these various groups. Now, if you look at the problem, the, I mean, if you look at the situation strictly from the Jordanian point of view, I think King Hussein has been badly treated by the media because, you see, Hussein is now in a very difficult situation. Hussein has consistently shown loyalty to the United States. He belongs to that category of, uh, 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 of states which I identify in the Arab world, the dependency monarchs, uh, as opposed to the petrodollar monarchs. The dependency monarchs are monarchies that are able to survive in the Arab Muslim world because they have local support from their people but they depend heavily for military and economic support abroad. This is not the situation in the petrodollar states because they don't depend on, on subsistence from the uh, outside world. They depend on the oil that they have in their own country. Now, King Hussein has demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt to be very loyal to the United States. And I think this is a point that needs to be borne in mind. However, King Hussein finds himself in a difficult situation in the sense that a large percentage of his local population are Palestinians. The man is boxed between a rock and a hard place. And it is dangerous and unwise for anyone to suggest to the man to commit suicide in the name of a friend. Because you will not be able to maintain your friendship after you're gone. This, I think, should be made very clear to Westerners because many people in the heat of battle are really saying the man is a traitor. He is not a traitor. And I was very shocked this morning to hear one of the commentators saying that Arabs are by nature traitors, which is a ridiculous kind of statement. I mean, you know, that's a racist statement, you see. But the, 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 the point that needs to be borne in mind here really is 
King Hussein is, is boxed in a very difficult situation. Now look at the Palestinians from their own point of view. This is where I think the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait is a tragedy of errors. Because you see, the Israelis stand to benefit from this tragedy of errors. One is Kuwait is the hand that lays the golden egg, both for the Palestinians and for the sheikhs who live in that region. If Iraq takes over Kuwait, the Palestinians find themselves hostage to Saddam Hussein, whether they like it or not. If Saddam Hussein is kicked out of the region, and the Palestinians are perceived by the Gulf states to be supporting Saddam Hussein, then of course you know what that means. It works in favor of the Israelis, because that means to say the Palestinian masses in the Gulf would no longer identify with the PLO leadership. And this works to the interests of the Israelis. And I think that's a point to be made. I, I have two, uh, just two observations here, one about the Jordanian-Palestinian side and the other about the, the Israeli side. There's an additional factor in the box that Hussein is in. And that is the fact that Israel, on his western border, has been threatening to destabilize and establish the Palestinian state in Jordan and expelling Palestinians from the West Bank into his country. The problem is, is that the danger he faces is that no one will defend him. And he counted on Saddam Hussein for defense. And he's now caught in a bind of regional alliances, a fear of Israel, protection from Iraq, a horrible miscalculation and, 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 and criminal act committed by Iraq, and the fear of no one to defend him. America has not, and he made it very clear to me when I met him about seven months ago, that the help he has sought from America to resolve the Palestinian question, to help his country survive, has not been forthcoming. He is in a bind. The Palestinians have given everything they could to this peace process, everything they could to the Intifada, and gotten nothing for it. And you want to talk about a people who feel hopeless and who feel betrayed, it's them. And they are in a historic bind of, of, of monumental <coughs> proportions. And so Saddam Hussein has come with an action as wrong and as criminal and as, 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 as inconceivable as it is in the context of Islam and Arab, inter-Arab relations. Their passions were inflamed as any people who feel frustrated, alienated deeply uh, alienated from the historical processes in the region c could possibly be. And that explains their, their response to this, a, a sense of hope where there was none. Now, we can understand that this hope <coughs> was not going to lead them anywhere, that Saddam Hussein is not going to liberate the West Bank and Gaza, but, but, but it's difficult to explain to the people caught in that bind, having given everything they could to a process and betrayed in that process, now feeling some sense of it. And Israel, I would suggest to you that in the short run, apparently the victor, but in the long run, out in the cold. Because for some country that was supposed to talk about the, 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 the hen that lays the, gold, the golden egg, whatever the expression is, <laughs> I mean, wake up and smell the coffee, Israel. You are an outsider in this region and, and must, in the long run, perceived, be perceived as an outsider in the region for a country that was supposed to be a strategic asset. It is now a monumental failure and a historic liability that we must deal with. And I think that the other issue that we must be pressing as Arab Americans and Muslim Americans is the fact that American foreign policy has created in part this conflict, has put us in the bind of siding with the wrong side, and created a, a, a mini monster that jeopardizes everything, our friends, our allies, our interests and concerns in the region. Israel must be relegated to of secondary importance to the US because it cannot help. Yeah. It can only hurt. Is that it true? Can, can Israel only help? Or had, I mean, and should is, be. is what would you say when uh, Jim says that Israel is not playing the role it should play? I would even. I think it's playing the role it should play because oh. I would take it even further because you have to now focus on the democratic structure of American politics. It's a great country, America. I think there's no uh, parallel with American constitutional liberties and freedom. But with respect to U.S. policy <coughs> on the Middle East, America <coughs> is not a democratic. There is no decency, I would use the word, when it comes to dealing with the world of Islam or in handling issues where Israel is involved. You have an entire captive Congress, and people have described that as an Israeli occupied territory. Let's, I, let's talk about the role of Israel in this conflict now. What, the role of Israel it, in this is conflict it? is that Israel sees, if I'm an Israeli, I would, I would be very threatened by the emergence 
of a country, although led by a Baathist, but still a Muslim country which has over a million men under arms, well-trained, battle-hardened, over 5,500 uh, tanks. I'm not counting the 265 tanks they got from Kuwait. <laughs> so you can add that also. And over 700 uh, planes. And with a very determined, ruthless, and even brutal ruler who has already threatened Israel with the, with the dire consequences should Israel try to uh, attack Iraq. So Israel is the basic beneficiary. What Israel would like to see at the end of it is that Iraq should be cut down to size. But what it is forgetting, that by cutting Iraq down to size and by removing Saddam, it is going to burst forth that jenny in, of Islamic activism. And that is one force in the world which is going to sweep the United States, which is going to sweep Israel, and it's going to topple many, many wealthy welfare states of the Middle East. OK, uh, I want to address the issue of jihad, Professor uh, Jafar Sheikh Idris. Uh, President Saddam Hussein, in the second day or so, called for jihad. Uh, what is jihad? Uh, <laughs> jihad, literally, it means just to do your utmost. But in the, in the special um, Islamic sense, uh, <clears throat> uh, to defend uh, Muslims and um, Islamic, um, Islamic, um, Islamic cause in whatever way you can, that is jihad. This can be by word of mouth or by taking uh, arms against uh, uh, an enemy. Is and Saddam Hussein to qualified to call for jihad? To call for jihad, I mean, but he would not be, he would not be uh, uh, mujahid uh, if, <laughs> if he himself is a Basi. He's a Basi. A Basi. Yes, because me, because no, I, I, uh, neither Saddam nor many other um, you know, Arab countries we are talking now about when we t t t t say Muslim states, we are, uh, uh, yes. uh, because these, they don't see themselves as Muslim states. They are secular. Yes. Uh, states. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Saddam's uh, foreign minister is not a, is not a Muslim. Tariq. So, uh, Tariq Aziz is not a protest. So, he is not claiming uh, that he is, uh, uh, is a Muslim ruler or that his country is uh, an, uh, an Islamic state. But that uh, does not yeah. have anything to do because yeah. in many Muslim states when they were, there were um, the prime ministers were and wazirs and so on. But let's go to the question is, uh, there, when he called for jihad, Again, none of the Muslim masses outside the Arab world came to the call. Okay. Now the perception, wait a minute. Now the perception is if anything happens between the American troops and the Iraqi troops, can Saddam Hussein call again for jihad? And will that be a jihad? Uh, it will, no, okay, well, yeah, well, I'll let, give you the let, let me just raise this point, then we can respond. First of all, I agree with mm -hmm. Professor Idris' uh, understanding of jihad, you know, in the classical Islamic sense of what jihad is. Of course, for the benefit of the non-Muslims, you must understand <laughs> that we have jihad kabir, mm -hmm. al-kabir, uh, which is the great jihad, which is really the control of your own nafs. You deal with yourself, because most human beings are at the level of nafsul amara, which is the self-degrading being. But you want to do the jihad so that you can rise to the highest level of spiritual development. That's the great jihad. The small jihad really is the jihad of interpersonal relations or intercommunal relations or inter umwertic relations. Now, Saddam Hussein, in my personal opinion, is not qualified to call the jihad because Saddam Hussein does not put Islam as the central principle that governs his life. He could be a Muslim, and only Allah knows that. I mean, what I would say is Saddam Hussein is not competent and to, to call a jihad against the West or against Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. Saddam Hussein is committed to Ba'atism, and we know what Ba'atism is. It's Arab nationalist socialism. And it is not likely that a person who subscribes to Ba'atism is qualified or is attractive enough to rally around Muslims in the Arab world or beyond. Now, when it comes to the question of the policy, that's why I try to point out to you that we must make a distinction between principles Saddam Hussein could very well 
And I think that we have a, a role to play by continuing to generate uh, public support for this initiative. Uh, how about how about the medical world?
take the picture and be horrified and and they're not voting. And the election is going to happen in November. We can defeat some people who's voting. We can help some people who's voting. And we should not allow this moment to break the hold of the of the, the close of the old county. We should be using this opportunity to do it. We have a historic challenge to increase the vote, to increase our giving to candidates, and to use this project to understand that we should be the voice of the applicant, but we're not going to be able to work. And on the question of the media, similarly, you know, we should be bombarding CNN with the fact that they hired some of the wrong people and some of the, the network, ABC, CBS, and NBC. We have a legitimate voice to be heard. And we have this, this round table. We should be an authority who goes to CNN. We have found the media more responsive this time than ever before. I don't know that any of the national parts are doing more. And we should be there too, as well as with CNN. You know, I want to talk a little bit about this project. Can you just start this project for me about the uh, mission? So the project is valid.
we want to be elected in November. We want to register the vote in June. So instead, we have a process underway in a certain state. The state convention is held last weekend. Basically, the state had an exact resolution on the issue, and that's where the state convention had a meeting where they could have won. And so we have to make sure that we can not, we have to at this point convince us of the need to understand that our voice is heard because we've been on the sidelines. And America has not been with us on this because we've been on the sidelines. This committee is right about the parallels of all of us the issues of AI and medicine.
party, the power party, which has uh, maybe not only very well grounded, obviously, but it too in the Muslim world has a part to play. And I think that that's where there is a lot of uh, trouble. But the, the good Arab party for the last 30 years has been indirectly addressed and degraded by the U.S. support of the state of Israel. Now, after having been oppressed and degraded, they are again coming to the court of the same party, the same authority that has been humiliating them, to ask for succor, for assistance. So they are going to the Arabs for freedom. So by doing so, they are going to open up a whole, whole variety of unemployment. And we need to be in a new situation
situation of 20 million Russians, which is very possible. And they say, oh, it's over. They don't do that. And you see, and many American guys will say, go to the United States. And tell you guys, I said, go to the world. And they can joke about it. And say, what's going on in our country? And you know how it is. There's a very important point, which I think that is just in the United States, and I think it was done. But in the United States, you have people who are not going to enter who could be also a new that they are in. We know that. Now, the reality of the point that makes me want to make this is that the only way I think that I'm going to put the given the democracy of understanding, you know, of the MOA and all the other things, is to really create a way out of it. There must be a moral state hype. That's what I'm going to say. Now, whether that is acceptable to the poor young United States and the little state in the West, in the West, is another question. Because Saddam Hussein said, the only way out of this problem he has created himself is the U.S. states are replaced by our Islamic states. And Saddam Hussein grew out. And the Soviets are given some kind of protection from people who have been insulting in the Soviet Union. Thank you. 
uh, the friendship with the great history, and that uh, nothing can be better than any kind of friendship because the battle has started, uh, not because of the time. Now, I am someone who likes to look at things historically and philosophically. Historically, I agree with Jim again in the sense that uh, what has happened in Europe since the conquest of Europe. European countries, and then later on the Soviet Union, uh, I mean, the liberals, have tried to work out the modus vivendi in Europe. So when you look at our two fighting, you must not look at it in a deep, uh, desperate uh, way. You must see it as a maturity process. That the Arabs are going to reach a level of political maturity as they begin to develop the kind of governments that are accountable to their people and governments that are democratic. That's what happened in Europe. When European had different kinds of government, they were not democratic. European nationalism became very divisive, and of course, we had Third World War, Second World War, the Crimean War, and all the other wars of Europe. So the Arab humanity has been to reach that level of political harmony and organization. What I'm saying is, one of the things we have to remember here as we look at Iraq, Iraq is the first Muslim country that is on the threshold of being admitted into the nuclear power. Now, this, of course, sends shivers to Pakistan. 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 Yeah, well, you know, Pakistan, yes, I can't say that only Pakistan. Pakistan is on the, uh, on the way to uh, the nuclear, uh, nuclear stuff. But what I'm saying is, Iraq is immediately one of the most industrialized states. So, Iraq could very well be in the 21st century, with or without Saddam Hussein, an industrial power. And this, as the Arabs were trying to argue earlier, would be seen as a threat of power. We are out of time. Before I ask each of us to give a small advice to the Muslim group, how are the Muslim relations going to deepen? I think I can talk about Pakistan, although Pakistan has decided to side with the USA and uh, the Saudi I have not had Muslim leaders come in Pakistan in the last couple of days. Now, there's no love for Iraq. Iraq has not been supporting Pakistan in the first So, but I have yet to meet a full Pakistani Muslim supporter of Pakistan heading in. Saudi Arabia, and significantly at the same time, also the Sunni groups, which are very close cousins, have come up with very strong statements. Like Muhammad Shah, Ahmad Durani, and Muhammad Abdul Rahman, they condemned outright the Pakistan disarmament of forces. And there's also been a very major demonstration in Karachi this week on August 15th, which all the US presence in uh, Saudi Arabia has been very pissed off. People are saying that we should do something about it. But my point is that even who has the means? America has the means to wage a war. I feel that there will be a war, unfortunately. The world will not be the same anymore. And lots of old citizens are going to drop out. Iraq may be militarily defeated with all this America's senior technology and air power. But what, what if America accomplishes all its goals? The House of Saudi ultimately after this is going to be destroyed. And the Arabic establishment is going to be shrinking. And Muslim freedom is going to be constrained. And then we face tremendous backlash against the West and Israel, and Muslims are not going to be part of the picture. Jim, let's start with you. What is your advice to Christians? Well, first of all, uh, I don't see this uh, vision of doing uh, <laughs> <laughs> as, as the best of the debate, even if you are going to be doing your work, and you like the Sunday songs and lightning, I don't uh, want to go to see how to do it. I would suggest that the president uh, grow a little bit. Some kind of contact with the Arabs. Terms of the commitment to implementation of those three UN resolutions, the restoration of slavery, the disappearance of land, and all that kind of thing, is to assist them on international law. But the best way to win and to affirm uh, the consistency of principles that will give us credibility we need to function in that region. <laughs> uh, one of the problems with the American foreign policy is the lack of credibility. And at this point, it's been in the US Minister. Consistency is the very key issue that the British have to consistency. And you want to be the first one. I think that we should all play the same good role. And I think that Bush has uh, handled it from an American standpoint very well. I think that he has not been giving that same credit. Who is it? It's just a consensus among the Muslim world, the Arab world, and has got the men behind it. And it's also an intellectual decision. But having said that, he has done it intelligently for American interests. I still feel that Operation Jealous will, will become Operation Jealous. Thank you. Thank you.